All right. We're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. Uh, we will pray in just a moment, and then we will uh, dive into the Word of God tonight. I, I do believe I have a word for us tonight, uh, and it is something that has been on my heart for a couple of weeks, and it, God just keeps seeming to put it right back there. And a phrase has been leaping out to me, and so I want to I want to I want to share it with you. And uh, perhaps it's nothing new. Uh, it 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 might be a restatement of a lot of things we've talked about over the last year, uh, but we're going to go ahead and restate them. Uh, we're going to go ahead and and relay, uh, water the seed that has been planted and. And just let the word of God do what it does. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. If you're there, say amen. I hear some pages rustling. All right. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. And take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe had fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. With your attention these next few moments, I want to preach or teach or uh, speak on this thought, every man a beam. Every man a beam. Why don't we stand together in this place? I want you to find somebody that is not related to you by blood or by marriage. And I want you to join hands with them. And we're going to pray in this house. Amen. All right, as you're still moving, let's go ahead and lift our hands. Let's lift our voices in this place and welcome the Lord into this house tonight. I thank you, God, uh, for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for your kindness and your love. You are a faithful God. Uh, you are a pure God. You are a holy God. There is none like you. There's none beside you. There's none before you. Uh, there is, God, none uh, that can compare to you. Uh, I exalt the name of Jesus in this house tonight. Uh, I lift up that beautiful and precious name. Uh, the Lord reigneth and so I can rejoice. Uh, I can take a firm confidence in that fact uh, that my God uh, is on the throne. Uh, nothing escapes the counsel of His eye. Nothing is beyond Him. Nothing is above His understanding. Uh, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts uh, are higher than my thoughts. Uh, Lord Lord, I pray let your word have its way in this house tonight. Uh, every distraction, uh, every discouragement, every spirit that would resist the working uh, of your word. Uh, I pray that it would be bound right now and cast out in Jesus' name. Uh, I pray that there would be a liberty in the house of God. Uh, a freedom in the house of God. Uh, let your word find its way down into every heart uh, and into every mind. Uh, in the name of Jesus. I pray. Why don't we clap our hands to the Lord and lift up a shout of triumph in this place. Come on, we talked about it on Sunday, the sound uh, of a shout of triumph. Uh, go ahead and lift up a, a shout of victory in the house. Uh, we're not a defeated church. Uh, we're a victorious people uh, serving the God who's already defeated death, uh, hell, and the grave. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. You may be seated. 
It feels better in the house of the Lord when the people of God make up their mind to press into the presence of God. Every man a beam. The portion of text that we read from 2 Kings chapter 6, it was a quick story that many of us are familiar with. It's a common Sunday school uh, piece. It was this new era in the, the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, the two nations that had come out of Jacob. And Elisha is now the prophet on the scene following the catching away in the chariots of fire of Elijah. And there is this thing or this organization or this group called the School of the Prophets. They are often called the Sons of the Prophets. And so evidently around Elisha, there is this group of younger prophets that are learning at his feet. They're receiving instruction in the art of it. And the location that they had with the prophet was too tight or it was too small for the growing school of the prophets. And so they came to the man of God and asked them, can we, can we stretch out our borders a little bit? And Elisha was willing to send them. See, the man of God and the people of God realized that where they were was beginning to be constricted. It was beginning to be tight. And they needed to build. They needed to reach out and, and begin to make new accommodations. Elisha was willing to send them. The man of God in the story, the man of God on the scene, he was not set in his comfort. I'm sure that that building that they lived in, there were some memories there. There were some comfortable things that had happened there. It was a familiar place. It was the school of the prophets. And yes, it was a little bit tight. And yes, it was getting a little bit too small. But my goodness, it was like where they had always been. It was where they had always stayed. And so it, it, it had this comfort to it. But the people came to the man of God and they had an eye to the future. They were looking outside of the existing walls of the school and realizing if growth is going to continue, if expansion is going to continue, we're going to have to leave this place of comfort and we're going to have to begin to build a new house. And they wanted him to go with them. It's powerful. It's powerful when the people... Believe in the preacher, and the preacher believes in the people. It's powerful when not just the, the people believe in the pulpit, but when the pulpit believes in those sitting in the pews. And if we can maintain that, if we can keep that, if we can walk in that realm, there is going to be an unleashing, an unlocking of a new level of power. See, I believe that God has been helping us over these last, uh, if, if you were here in 2019, do you remember in 2019, God began to speak to this church as a drumbeat. This is a sending church. This is a sending church. It's time to go. This is a sending church. And we began gearing up for that. We began ramping up for that. And then 2020 happened. 2020 happened. That was a year. But God was working something inside of this church. And God was stirring something inside of this church. And then God began to add pieces to the church. Some came from the outside. And some backsliders came home. And some within the church grew by leaps and bounds. And God began to prepare people for what happens in 2021. In 2021, we, we begin to grow. And we reach this place where there's a shift. There's a change. And I'm not calling Bishop Elijah, I'm not calling myself Elisha, but we can see that there's this, this transferring of, of, of authority, this transfer and changeover of the church, and then all of a sudden, 
we do what God's been asking us to do for about three years up to that point. We begin to step out by faith. We begin to stretch out. We begin to go. Why? Because the school of the prophets or the place that we were was too tight for us. Yes, I know we all fit in the building on a Sunday, but it doesn't fit in the building on a Sunday. The totality of what God wanted to do required the people of God to begin to step out of their comfort zone and begin to go out down to the Jordan and begin to prepare new accommodations to bring in the totality of what God was wanting to accomplish in that region. I told you it's going to be a little bit of a restatement. We saw that in, in, in action. We saw that in proof this Sunday as, as the Millbank Church was launched. And I'm so thankful for those that took the time out of their day and their week to drive up to Millbank, North Dakota for their second or even third church, or South Dakota. Uh, woo. Their second or, yeah, it was a long drive, right? Their second or third church service of a Sunday and to see 11 adults from the city of Millbank in the building that God gave to Jesus Church of Millbank and to see the name of Jesus lifted up. There's a plaque on that wall. They celebrated their centennial in 1988. Five days before I was born, May 15th, 1988, that church in Millbank celebrated its 100-year anniversary. So in 1888, somebody built and maintained a congregational church in Millbank, South Dakota, with God knowing all along that one day, one day the truth of the Word of God was going to be proclaimed in that building. Think of what God did for over 130 years. He kept a stone building standing in Millbank because the day was going to come where a man and a wife and a team behind them were going to step into the city of Millbank and begin to proclaim that God was manifested in the flesh, begin to proclaim the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, and Jesus named baptism in Millbank, South Dakota. What an incredible God that we serve. What a mighty God that we serve. Think about it. Before you were even born, God was looking for to 2023 saying, I'm going to give them a church. And I'm going to build a church in Millbank that somebody else paid for. I'm going to give it to people that are going to preach the truth of the word of God. Man, you're telling me that God can't come through. He came through 100 years in advance, 135 years in advance. Uh, it's like the children of Israel as they're leaving Egypt. They find themselves in the desert, and the water is bitter. And God tells Moses, you go cut down that tree, cast it in the waters, and the waters will be healed. That means that before the children of Israel ever left Egypt, God had already planted the tree that he knew was going to be cut down to make bitter water sweet. Uh, look, whatever situation, whatever you're going through right now, we serve a God that's already solved it. You've got to remember, He exists outside of time. Uh, when He speaks it, it's already done. The problem that you're facing, He's already living both in that moment and simultaneously in the resolution of that problem. There is nothing too hard or too great or too big for our God to take care of. Our problems only seem big to us, but to our God, he can do all things. And so, they came to him and said, look, we got we to get out of here. I'm thankful over these last 18 months or so, not only has it been preached from this pulpit, but it's been, it's been questioned from the pews, can I, can I get out of here? Now, I'm glad that people aren't itching to get out of here <laughs> uh, in, the, in the sense of leaving the body. But people will come and say, well, I want to I start a group here, and I, I want to go to the nursing home, and 
I want to have a group in my home. Can I, can I start a life group? And I want you to know and I want you to hear it again from the pulpit. The answer is most likely going to be yes. And if it's not an immediate yes, the answer is going to be yes. But let's build you. Let's prepare you. Let's ready you for the sending. The, pre the preacher believes in the people. I believe the people believe in the preacher. And together we will continue to go forward. And together we're going to continue to grow. But the key is this, everyone went. The work was large. They did not hire it out, they went. The Bible says that we should be praying to the Lord of the harvest, asking him to send laborers into the harvest, but that does not excuse us from sending ourselves into the harvest. On your way to the field, be praying, God, send somebody else into the harvest. God, send somebody right behind me, right beside me. Lord, bring somebody to the place that I'm at. But don't excuse yourself from going. You go. And we read that portion of Scripture where it said, every man a beam. Every man was responsible for bringing a beam. Every single one of these prophets was responsible for taking an axe, felling a tree, laying it on their shoulder, and dragging it to the site where they were going to build a new school for the prophets. Everyone shouldered the load. We've got a large field. And we are low on laborers. And every laborer matters. Every man, woman, teenager, and child under the sound of my voice matters. Your work in the kingdom of God is important and it is necessary. Every one of us, every man, woman, teenager, and child uh, must put a beam on their shoulder and begin to go forward if we're going to see the totality of what God has spoken and promised to us in this region. It's got to be every man a beam. It's got to be every woman uh, a load on their shoulders. It's got to be every Everybody from a young age with an eye to the future. It's too big for one. It's too big for two. It's too big for 10. It's too big for 20. It needs every single one of us. But not everyone was properly equipped. These were young prophets. They were men of study. They were men of the word. They were men of prophecy. And they were stepping outside of their comfort zone to do this work. Look, you might be an electrician. You might be a businessman. You might be a plumber. You might be a school teacher or a baker or a stay-at-home mom. You feel improperly equipped for the task in front of you. Think about these, these men. I, I, I don't picture the school of the prophets as like the hardest men out there. They probably weren't lumberjacks. And in fact, when one of the prophets begins to cut down his tree, he takes a mighty swing and whoop, there goes the axe head. Now, a skilled person with an axe is not likely to like fling the axe head. I've actually never had that happen with me. Now, the last time I cut down a tree was quite a while ago. I did get a chainsaw stuck in a tree once. That was uh, something that was impressive. Uh, I'm not sure how you managed to get a chainsaw stuck in a tree, but I got a chainsaw stuck in a tree. But I've never flung an axe head. If, has anybody ever, actually, you know what, let's just pause. Has anybody ever cut down a tree with an axe? <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> All right, so those are our subject matter experts. The rest of us, I do own an axe. It is dull. Uh, it's got duct tape holding the head on right now, and the head is, like, completely rusty. It's actually not for cutting trees at all. It's for busting ice out of sloughs so that I can shoot ducks, okay? That's the only reason I own an axe. I got it from my dad. Uh, it was 
not great when he gave it to me, and he's never asked for it back, so I've kept it. But here they go, these ill-prepared and unequipped laborers. Look, if you're waiting to feel completely prepared to step out into what God is asking you to do, you're going to be waiting a long time. It's like the new parents that, that always say, well, it, 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 you're never ready for that first child. You're not. You can read every book you want to read. You can go to every class that you want to go to. You can attend any, any seminar on parenting. In fact, you know the thing that pa- new parents hate hearing the most? Oh, just wait till you have kids. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Did you hear that before you had kids? And you're like, oh, my gosh, I wish people would quit saying that. I already know. The fact is you don't know. I remember coming home from the hospital with that new baby. We had Tegan, and we came home from the hospital, and my wife and I looked at each other, and we looked at the child, and we looked at each other. What do we do now? Like in the hospital, you get help. In the church, you get help. You, you, you got the body all around you. You've got everybody there that's there to help you, equip you. Where your gifts lack, your brothers come in, and all of a sudden, they're able to do it for you. Where we didn't know what to do, the nurses at the hospital, man, they took great care of us. But there we were in our house seven years ago, holding our newborn child, trying desperately to remember all of the pieces of advice that everybody had given us that we were too cool and too qualified for before we had kids kids. It's the same thing in the kingdom of God. Look, you're never fully prepared, but God says, step out. The place where you're at, it's too tight for you. You got to get out. You got to move beyond where you're at and begin to stride forward into the place where I'm calling you. And so there they are at the riverbank with axes and they're cutting down trees and they're probably not the best at it. And here this guy goes, he takes a swing. The axe head flies into the Jordan River, but God God begins to work with a young man that is not qualified, and God speaks, or through Elisha the prophet, they throw a stick in there, and the iron swims, and the young man is able to take it back. Even if you lack, when you step out into the will of God, God is going to meet your shortcomings. God is going to help the areas where you're not sufficient and you're not adequate. You might think, I stumble over my words. God will put the words in your mouth. You'll say, well, I I can't memorize scripture. God will quicken to your mind. If you're making the effort to hide the word of God in your heart, in those moments, God will begin to quicken them to your mind. If you don't know how to pray or what to pray, and sometimes you get all tongue-tied when you're about to lay hands on somebody, if you'll trust in God to make up your lack, if you'll trust in God because you're stepping out in sincerity and obedience to God's design and plan for you, then God will supply every single one of your needs. God's going to take care of his people. But there are three beams that I want to talk about tonight very quickly. Three beams. And I believe that each of us needs to bear this load. The first beam is this. Every man Involved in the labor. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, we begin to read in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. A real problem began to crop up inside of the church. You'll notice it doesn't say they felt their widows were being neglected, it's a statement of fact. The widows were being neglected. There was an actual problem going on here. And so they begin to murmur and complain, and the disciples, uh, the apostles get word of it. They, they, they read the room. They feel what's going on. They discern this, this murmuring that's happened. And so they, they begin to call the multitude of the disciples to them and said, look, it is not reason that we should 
Leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So growth brought challenge. How many want the church to continue to grow? How many want to be in crazy trouble and not know what to do next? Those two things are probably the same. As the church grows, challenges will grow with it. As the church grows, somebody will be sitting in your seat when you come out of the prayer room on Sunday. You got a little pre-taste of that this Sunday when AYC was here. And people were sitting on the other side of the church. I've never seen them move in, in three, four, five years of church. They've sat in the same spot. But all of a sudden, you come out, and some young whippersnapper from Kentucky is in your seat. And you're like, hey, that's my chair. Growth brought challenge. And the problem with it was is that the challenge began to throttle the effectiveness of the apostles. They had reached a place where the apostles had reached a maximum of what they were able to output. And so a solution was sought, and there was a, a call that went forth, we need laborers. And the apostles began to say, look, it's not, it's not reason for us to leave the ministry of the word of God to wait tables. Let me, let me deal with that real quick. The apostles were not too good to wait tables. Before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, they were. Because we see the apostles arguing about who's the greatest but what does Jesus teach them in that moment? He sets aside his coat. He takes a towel. He washes their feet. At this point in the, in the story of the church, that's the apostles. They're serving the people of God. But they also have a responsibility to the ministry of the word. Peter, James, John, and the rest of the apostles, it, it had nothing to do with them being too good for the work. If ever the man of God is too good for the work... That's a cause for the church to be concerned and a cause for the church to go to prayer. But Peter, James, and John, it's, it, they weren't up on some ivory throne saying, well, bless God, I'm not going to wait tables. That is below me. That's not what they're doing. They're saying, look, we're, we're doing this, but it's taxing us, and what we're called to do primarily we're not able to do. And so a solution was sought. And what was the solution? The solution was this. Every man get a beam on your shoulder and begin to carry the load together. See, it's not about who's better, who's good, who's this, who's that. It wasn't a hierarchy issue. It was a body issue. The apostles realized, look, we've got to be the apostles. We've got to be the ones that are in the word, studying the word of God, giving ourselves fully to prayer. The hand has to be the hand. The mouth has to be the mouth. The foot has to be the foot. Have you ever seen somebody paint with their feet? Is that not impressive? That is mind-boggling. Some of the quality paintings, like they can manipulate paintbrushes with their, you know what, here, let me take my shoe out. No, I'm just kidding. You don't want to see my feet. They can manipulate paintbrushes with their toes. Their toes have learned to do incredible things. But I can almost guarantee you every single one of them would rather be painting with their hands. Why? Because that's what the hand is designed to do. And the body can accommodate. The body can do incredible things. And people can be stretched outside of their calling and outside of their position in the body because of necessity. But how much greater would it be if everybody took the beam on their shoulder and we began to walk together forward with one mind and one accord, the hand being the hand, the foot, the foot, the mouth, the mouth. And so they call and they, they ask the people, look, pick out seven men 
and we'll, we'll anoint them for the work. See, we are not going to be a clergy laity church. We will not be an 80-20 church. Now, I don't believe we are. And so don't, don't misinterpret how I, how, what I'm saying or how I feel about this. I believe we're a church that's actively involved. But hear, hear this simply tonight, a call for every man with a beam on their shoulder, every woman with a beam on their shoulder. We're walking together in step forward into what God is calling us to do. We're not going to be an 80 church where 20% of the people do 80 80% of the work. We're going to be a church where everybody has a, a beam on shoulder and we're moving forward together. Listen to the stipulation or the, the qualifications for ministry. Honest men. Full of the Holy Ghost. And full of wisdom. Not do they have experience. That, that might be something, you know, we might look for. Have they ever been a server at a restaurant before? Look, if you're going to be honest and you're going to be full of the Holy Ghost, God's going to equip you to do the task that he calls you to. And so they call these men to them and they lay hands on them and they pray for them. And we pick it up in verse 6 of Acts 6. It says, when they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And look at the results. So here we are in picture now. Everybody's got the appropriate beam back on their shoulder. The apostles are carrying the weight of the word and giving themselves to prayer. Deacons now have taken some of the load off of the apostles. And everybody's doing what their body part is supposed to do. And look at verse 7, if you can put verse 7 up there. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly. Before they were multiplying, God was adding to the church in Acts chapter 2. By Acts chapter 6, there's multiplication. But by this time, once they've appointed the deacons, now they multiply greatly. The rate of growth increased when everybody had a beam on their shoulder. This is not a church with professionals and laity in the seats. This is a church where every spirit-filled believer is going to hear the voice of God and the call of God, and we're going to go forth together, everyone bearing the weight on their shoulders. Uh, I want to see this. How many want to see uh, there being a great multiplication of the Word of God, uh, a great number of disciples being added, and uh, a great number of the priests or a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Uh, if you'll allow me to stretch that just a little bit, uh, let's just say a, a great number of a different denomination uh, or even leadership in different denominations began to be added uh, to the church of the living God, all because uh, somebody was willing to take a beam of waiting tables on their shoulder and say, uh, I'm Holy Ghost filled, uh, but this is the task that God has called me to do, and so I'm going to do it with honesty and I'm going to do it with wisdom and I'm going to do it with everything that I've got. We all want that. But look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. How many want that too? Is there anybody that's hungry for the power of God to flow through your life like never before? If you're hungry for that, why don't you lift a hand in this place right now? Jesus, I want your power to begin to flow through my life like never before. I want you, God, to begin to move through me. I don't want to read about it in the Word of God and not experience it in my life in Jesus' name. So here is this table waiter. Let's move it into modern context. We've got department heads in this church. I'll just pick on the facility manager. Here he is, facility manager. Waiting tables was not an inherently spiritual job. But evidently, this not inherently spiritual job was the, the, the thing that was locking down the revival that God wanted to pour out. Could it be that the simple physical things are the things that are holding back the level of revival that God desires to pour out? 
And all he's looking for is a spiritual man or woman to humble themselves and stop waiting for the position with the microphone and the pulpit and the recognition and the fame and say, you know what, there's a table over there that needs waited. Uh, yes, I'm an honest man. I'm an honest woman. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I've got the wisdom of God on me. But I'm going to go wait a table or I'm going to go mow a lawn or I'm going to go scrub a toilet or I'm going to go vacuum the carpet. I'm going to go fill the van with gas. I'm going to go pick up kids every single Sunday. And God said, hey, that guy right there, I'm going to move through him. I'm going to begin to flow through Stephen. I'm going to begin to pour out uh, mighty signs and wonders. Uh, could it be that the physical is what is locking up the spiritual and God's just waiting for somebody to humble themselves and say, uh, there's no job too small for me to do it with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Uh, there's no task too unimportant for me to have a bad attitude about it uh, or a rotten spirit about it. Uh, I'm going to do it with the anointing of the Holy Ghost on me. Because I can guarantee you Stephen was not upset to be tasked as a table waiter. He had a great attitude about it because God began to move through him. It is a blessing to work for the kingdom of God. In fact, I remember distinctly a time where a, a I, I'm not going to use his name, but a man of God came through this church and he, he rebuked Bishop and I. And this was back probably in about 2016. And he said, you are robbing the people of a blessing. And we're like, what? I, ain't, I don't want to be robbing the people because there was a workload that needed to be shared. It needed to be split up. It needed to be divided. And he said, you're robbing the people of an opportunity to put that load on their shoulder and carry it forward so that God can bless them for doing the work with a right attitude and a right spirit. And so Stephen began to carry it. Look, Stephen gets out of Bible college. Stephen gets out of minister's training class. And he's all excited. Ah, I'm going to take Jerusalem. It's going to be wild. And the first job he gets, why don't you wait these tables where these widows are murmuring? If you've ever hung around with murmuring widows, see, that's why they needed to be full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the women were murmuring. <laughs> all right, we're going to move on. I didn't hear any amen. It's so weird. Every man a beam. Make up in your mind that nothing is beneath you. If something is beneath you, then God's anointing is beyond you. If you can't humble yourself enough to do the task at hand with a good attitude, then God's, God's anointing is beyond you. The second beam that everybody needs to have on their shoulder is every man, woman, teenager, child used in the gifts of the spirit first corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4 says this now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man everybody say every man Everybody say, every man. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit. Dividing to every man severally as he will. That word dividing... Is from the Greek word diahireho, which means to separate or distribute. The same Spirit of God that flows through me flowed through Peter, John, James, Paul, and God distributed to them the gifts necessary for the advancement and the furthering of the kingdom. And God divides to every man 
severally as he will. That's, that word severally is idios or idios. It means pertaining to self, one's own, or by implication, private or separate. God wants to give everybody in this room a gift of the Spirit. God wants to lay upon every person in this room a gifting in the Spirit. He desires to give it to every man. And we must not remain a church where five or so people operate in the gifts of the Spirit. That is not the will of God for Jesus' church as we press forward into the promise. But we must be a church where Every man puts the beam of the gift of the Spirit on their shoulder and begins to walk forward. We must not be a church where the gifts only operate inside of these four walls and only on Sundays or at a special service when there's some highfalutin preacher here. But we're going to be a church of God that flows in the gifting and the anointing of the Holy Ghost outside of the walls of this building building. We must press further in the Holy Ghost uh, until we begin to see God flowing through every man and every woman. uh, And in a moment of compassion, in a moment uh, of anointing, you'll be somewhere out in public uh, and God will begin to flow through you and the gifts of healing will begin to flow through your hands. That is God's desire for His church. When your neighbor makes the effort to cross the street. God wants to lay in your mind a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom or the discerning of spirits and he's going to show you how to pray for them. God wants to do that for you. Every man. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, this is an obvious statement. You have his spirit inside of you. We could get all hyped right now by verses like, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Greater works than all these shall ye do. Or Peter, when he's at the temple with John in Acts chapter 3, Such as I have, give I you. Now you can't give it if you don't have it. And one of the qualifications for these deacons was to be men filled with the Holy Ghost. And so look, if you're not walking with an overflow of the Spirit of God inside of you right now, you need to be. You need to be walking with God's Spirit just pouring a river of living water springing up out of your belly, rushing forth out of you so that God in a moment of time can simply nudge you wherever you're at uh, and He will place in your hand or in your mouth whatever gift is most necessary for the situation that you have allowed Him to place you in. Uh, If you've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost for any length of time and you can't remember the last time that you operated in a gift of the Spirit, there is a cause for concern in your walk with God. God desires, God gives to every man severally as he will. What kind of father goes so long without giving his children gifts? Hear me right now. This is a safe place to practice. This is a safe place to grow in the use of God or in the flowing of the Spirit. The very worst thing that could happen to you if you stepped out by faith and you begin to feel something in a worship service and you've never felt it before and you step out, the worst thing that could happen is that you're wrong. Whoop-de-doo. Because I got news for you. You've been wrong before, and you're going to be wrong again. Anybody ever been wrong? Every hand should be up right now. We've been wrong. And if you fail here, there are people that love you enough that are going to take you aside, and we're going to just begin to explain the Word of God a little bit more perfectly, and there's going to be a sharpening effect. There's going to be a tweaking effect so that when you're out in the community and God begins to flow, now you can walk in confidence because you felt that before. It's the voice that you know. You want to know why it's easy for some people to speak out a tongue or some people to speak out an interpretation of tongue? Because they've grown that muscle through exercise. 
Look, again, I'll say it. If you've not been used in a gift of the Spirit, you need to be asking God, okay, God, is there something inside of me that's hindering it? Or are you speaking and I'm just missing it? Or you felt God. In fact, the last time that we had a a message in tongues that was not interpreted, do you guys remember that? I spoke and I said, look, God is, is nudging somebody right now. Somebody came up to me after service and said that's exactly what was happening. God was showing me. He was giving me words to say, but I was too scared to say it. Practice it. Begin to flow it. Begin to be familiar with that voice. Begin to be familiar with the nudging of the Holy Ghost. Not everybody's going to give a message in tongues. And newsflash, that's not the only gift of the Spirit. There are prophets in this room that have been quenching the spirit of prophecy that comes over them because they're feeling scared or they haven't exercised that muscle. And you think it's just a a little stirring in in the moment or a little tingle down your leg. No, God's trying to flow through you in a gift. And so you've got to put that beam on your shoulder and bring that gift of the spirit to the church and allow God to begin to flow through you. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be, the more acquainted you'll be with the voice of God and the easier it will be to yield to the flowing of the Spirit through you. We've got to become a church where anybody at any moment could begin to be used in a gift of the Spirit. Whatever gift is most necessary for the edification of the body and the advancement of the kingdom, be praying, God, I want a covet earnestly the best gifts. If you're going to be praying this week, which all of us are, I want you to be praying, God, I want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not going to pick one. Lord, yes, I want to prophesy. In fact, the Bible tells us covet to prophesy. But I want you to be coveting earnestly the best gifts. Don't look at uh, at sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so when God begins to flow through them again. You go home and covet it and say, I want what they have. I, I want what they have. Not I don't want them to have it, but I want to have that too. Does that difference make sense? You begin to covet earnestly the best gifts. Why? Because God wants to lay on the shoulder of every man, woman, and child in this place a a gift of the Spirit so that his body can be built up, strengthened, and edified. And at any given moment, be it on a Sunday or a Wednesday or a Tuesday or you're in your home, God will begin to flow through you. Man, I don't know. That makes me excited. People staring at me like I'm crazy. All right, the third thing, the third beam that we have to have and have to maintain in this church, every man carrying their cross. This is by far the most important beam that you could ever bear. Yes, I want to I work for the kingdom of God. Yes, I want the gifts of the Spirit to flow through me. But more important than all of that is that I carry my cross. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said to them all, If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whomsoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Do you want to have value for the kingdom? I do. Do you want to be found a vessel meet for the master's use? I want to be that cup that God reaches for every day. How many have a favorite cup in your house? What about that cup makes it special to you? Mine ain't anything super special. It's a yellow Dickies barbecue cup. I got like six of them. But everybody in the house knows those are my cups. And every day I'm reaching for them. I want to be the vessel that God reaches for every single day. Now, I know he's a great big God, and to limit him to one person is is folly. Surely you understand what I'm saying, though. I want to be the one that God is so comfortable when he opens that cupboard and he's looking for a vessel. (laughs) There it is. 
the yellow Dickies barbecue cup. That one's mine. I'm taking that. This is my comfort cup. This is my daily cup. This is the cup I use. Look, I don't care if it's a special occasion. I'm probably still drinking out of my yellow Dickies barbecue cup. My wife has given up the fight. It does not matter anymore. She knows that I like those cups. In fact, uh, that people just like take them and stick them in the dishwasher. I'm like, hey, where's my cup? I want to be a vessel meat for the master's use. The only way I can do that is to die daily. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Talented individuals live in a realm of danger that untalented people like myself or one talented people like myself don't live in. The danger of a five-talent individual is self-reliance. Now, the one-talent individual, their danger is fear and self-preservation. But the moment that I begin to rely on myself and my own accomplishments and my own wisdom and my own strength and my own finances, I have prayed, and so far to this point in my life, God has God has let it be 100% true. I pray, God, let me not be so poor that I curse you and so rich that I forget you. He's given me just enough to know that I need him every single day. I don't want to be a people that's reliant on our music team. I don't want to be a people that's reliant on good preaching. Don't, don't get me wrong. All of those things are necessary and important. I don't want to be a people that's reliant on a quality greeting team or an amazing bus ministry. We should have all of those things. I don't want to be a people that's reliant on an outreach department that's incredible or the grass that is mowed just so and just right. I want to be a church that has picked up the beam of the cross and said, no, without Jesus Christ, this is completely pointless. I want to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not some decision that you can just make this Wednesday and it's never had to be made again for your life. But tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and you're going to have to make a decision, Haja. You're going to have to choose. Look, I'm going to take the cross of Christ onto my shoulder today and I'm going to carry that beam. Uh, nobody else might be carrying it. The, the number might be few. Uh, but I choose to deny myself. I choose to tell myself no. I choose to control the urges of this flesh through the power of the grace of God so that his kingdom can be manifested through me. Why don't we stand together in this place tonight?